Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Don Frank. We're at Hawks View Cellars in Sherwood. Uh, this is June 15th, 2020. Don, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate this. Sure. Uh, first question, most important question, uh, why wine? Well, I have always been a big fan of science and chemistry. My dad is a food scientist and um, I guess it's his fault. He let me uh, taste wine at his table, uh, you know, the dining room table and um, even when I was a young person and I was, uh, wine was part of very nice meals and we all were together and so I always liked wine from, from that experience I suppose and uh, then when I uh, was in college, you know, I, I, I made wine uh, as like a, just a hobbyist, you know, it was a Purdue University. And, um, you know, there's a lot of this great uh, blueberry wine made there. And they, they have French American hybrids. They don't have the real, they can't grow the real vinifera very well like we do. But um, anyway, uh, I was able to just make some wines there and I was a hobbyist just making wine and beer at home and in the dorm rooms and stuff and uh, I just, um, I, I, I took a degree in biochemistry and by the time I'd finished I had decided that it wasn't for me, pure science wasn't for me so I ended up with um, just really enjoying food science and my dad was a food scientist as well so Anyway, I ended up in the food science curriculum, got a degree, degree in food science from Purdue University. But while I was in the food science department, the coolest part of the food science department was the wine, uh, the wine uh, department. So a small wine department, and uh, I think you know, in the end, it's uh, the guy um, with the improbable name of Dr. Richard Vine uh, that really sort of solidified the deal. I took his wine appreciation class when I was 21 at Purdue and um, I was already in the food science curriculum, got a job in his lab, uh, making small amounts of wine from French American hybrids uh, in, um, you know, in and around Lafayette, Indiana. And it was just uh, the coolest thing. I loved it. I loved production. I loved the scientific uh, analysis of wine. It was an applied science, whereas biochemistry was a pure science. So I really enjoyed the applied science part of it. Much to my father's chagrin, I didn't become a food uh, scientist in the way he is. Uh, no soy protein for me. I ended up in the in the wine department. So, and then when I graduated, instead of working for like Nestle or my dad's company or where else in Purina, like my dad did, I ended up uh, driving out here to Oregon. So let's, let's talk about that. Why from what, what what's the bridge there from school in Indiana to going to Oregon? Why Oregon and not somewhere else? I think it's got to be Richard Vine, Dr. Vine again. Um, he called uh, <laughs> what was happening in America around that time as the or I don't know, he called it the cult of Pinot Noir, and he always said that there was this small undercurrent of this wine grape in America, just as Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay took over California, there was always uh, somebody making Pinot Noir uh, and um, uh, you know that whole thing about Andrew, Andrew Tichelchev says you know the Cabernet Sauvignon is made by God and Pinot Noir is made by the devil, it's, he sort of repeated that sort of mythology and ideology in class, you know, um, into a room of 350 people trying to taste wine with them. It was the biggest wine appreciation group ever, you know, it was this huge forum, but he really played up this idea of Pinot Noir being this really difficult to grow and very uh, special wine grape, and so I was really interested in trying to uh, figure out how to grow that. But I also fell in love with Oregon just from tasting myself. You know, I went to these wine tasting rooms and got a chance to, um, uh, a chance to enjoy uh, Pinot Noir in a, in a visit to Oregon early on. And so I just thought, this is the place. It's not California, it's Oregon. So it's really his uh, indoctrination. And, and there was just one small chapter in his book about Oregon, but it's, uh, it was very influential to me, I suppose. So. I came out to Oregon and um, after college instead of working for a food science place, so um, yeah, I don't know. And then uh, called folks in the directory until I found some somebody that was hiring during the harvest of 2001. So uh, when you came to Oregon, first place you worked? Uh, Montsnor. So I just I got, I got to um, Portland. I paid my friend who was a roommate in, at Purdue. 
$50 a month to stay in his attic. I had to buy a ladder. Everything that I owned had to fit in like a big, you know, uh, five by five square hole up into his attic. It was not a great place, but it, you know, it was a shower and uh, I called different wineries out of a book I picked up until I found um, Montenor, I guess I called A to M, but uh, Montenor, Jacques was on the phone, this guy Jacques Tardet, and he had just lost his pump over person like that minute or that hour or that day or something, you know. And he said, can you come right now? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> it was already two, but I just drove out to Forest Grove from Portland and, um, you know, he showed me how to pump over a tank and I pumped over a bunch of tanks and helped him press off the reds and then, um, you know, they gave me a couple of cases of wine, you know, and then I left, you know, it was like, it was like that. I mean, of course, I made a small amount of money, but uh, it was really the, quite a great experience. Uh, I still use some of the Jacques Tardet-isms uh, to this day. He said, because um, I, I had sanitized something, but I left a bunch of grapes on it, but I thought I had sanitized it, but I had not cleaned it first. And so he said, if you sanitize shit, it is still shit. So, which, I mean, I guess is the point is you're supposed to clean it first, then sanitize it. Uh, so I still use that as I've trained interns over the years. I try to keep the French accent because it's a little more forceful that way. Jacques, Jacques was great. He was making wine off an estate property mostly. Um, and it was fun to see that kind of smaller operation in business. And it wasn't, it wasn't tiny. It was kind of maybe medium sized for Oregon at that time. And, uh, so anyway, I got I caught the bug, but I mean everybody gets laid off at, at harvest uh, when it's over. You know, there's there's not everybody, but most, and so there was no more job. Uh, so I cleaned everything with caustic soda and a brush, you know, and goggles in an apron on ladders around the winery, and then when it was all clean. I think they kept me on enough, long enough to top off the barrel cellar one time. And, and then they're like, all right, there's no more work, you gotta go. Uh, I did a lot of lease filtration and that sort of thing, the, just the worst jobs. <laughs> and then, uh, then I had to go, you know, cause there's just nobody left. They did most of their harvest with a vineyard crew and just, just the one extra person myself. So, um, so I cast about a little bit for a sec and um, I was an Oregon beer snob. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, the Support Oregon Native Beer. Uh, it's just this SNOB, uh, it's an acronym. But um, I was just, I, I was, you know, I worked at a brew co brewing company in a college and um, I, you know, I, they, they advertise a job for a, um, not a seller person in, in the, in the industry, it's called like an assistant brewer. So I was, I just washed kegs and helped, helped mash out and shovel things and lift big <laughs> bags of grain. But I had worked in college as a brew, as a bartender at a brewery and was a home brewer myself. So I was excited about beer. And um, so I got a job in uh, McMinnville, Oregon, working for a guy named Noel Arce uh, at uh, Golden Valley. And so I started working at Golden Valley, which was great because it was the official um, like brewery, a wine country a little bit, because it's in McMinnville, there's a lot of winemakers that are going in for a beer, and so you meet a lot of people that way, winemaker types. We shared a forklift with um, Panther Creek, and in the 2002 vintage, my boss, Noel, jumped ship, the head brewer, to be an assistant, um, or a crush assistant, at uh, just, just only, I mean, was it, three blocks away over at Panther Creek, the Kaplans were the owners at that point of Panther Creek, and um, Michael Stevenson was the winemaker. And so, um, you know, I sorted fruit by night and brewed Tannenbaum by day. And, um, you know, brewing is like super early in the morning, and, and you're ending up like cleaning up at, you know, 12 o'clock at night. And so I guess I didn't sleep for a while that harvest. But the Kaplans were great. They would make make food for everybody and we would all sit down after harvest and eat. I never made any money uh, sorting grapes to that 2002 harvest. In 2002 was really a great harvest so there's not, not a lot of bad fruit to sort out. But um, but yeah, they gave me a bunch of wine at the end um, and uh, Jack Rovix uh, Jr. who was the uh, uh, I guess marketing coordinator, but also de facto assistant winemaker for a while, uh, gave me a bunch of wine and sent me on my way. But um, yeah, I just, uh, after that experience to the second, the second harvest, I thought, man, I really want to get a job in the wine industry. So my boss, uh, my old boss, Noel at the brewery, 
quickly got a job at Willamette Valley Vineyards. Uh, this guy named Forrest Klafke was a head winemaker there at the time in 2003 now, I guess just, just 2003, you know, February, and, um, and as kind of an assistant winemaker type, and he hired me on as a seller hand. And um, Forrest was bragging to his friends later, I heard, that he got two brewers for the price of one, <laughs> one winemaker. He hired us both, uh, kind of one after the other, and um, he liked caustic soda and cleaning things thoroughly and wanted to bring some hygiene to his winery. That, the, the kind of hygiene you have to have at a brewery. See, w when you make beer, you don't have any acid uh, in the wine, in the beer, and so uh, and the alcohol is pretty low, so you're not as protected against spoilage microorganisms. Anyway, the long story is there, you have to be very clean in a brewery, so Forrest was happy to hire a brewer because he, or two brewers, because he thought it would be rather clean. Um, Forrest was uh, quite, a, quite a character. He was out of uh, big wineries in California, worked at Woodbridge Mondavi, an Italian Swiss colony, and um, a few other really, really big wineries and a distillery as well. So anyway, he was a cellar person. Uh, for, they started that way. And uh, you know, I think when I met Forrest, I knew enough to be dangerous, but I really wasn't a winemaker. Um, but you know, he passed away, I guess, uh, in 2009. When he did, I was a winemaker, you know, so it's all his fault either way, I guess, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he was my big mentor. I spent from that time on until I left, I left right before the 15 harvest at Wellington Valley Vineyard. So that was a good long time, 2003 to 2015, wherein I did everything you might imagine, just from, uh, uh, so I was hired as a seller hand, sort of had to learn Spanish in order to like manage, um, a group of really fantastic seller people that were uh, Spanish speaking only um, and we had a, just a great time doing seller work you know and that's where I really learned my um, you know there's two ways of making wine there's the there's the harvest and I think people who cycle into harvest or for example do two harvests in a, in a year uh, it's really a great experience but that's just half of the process you know the other half is finishing the wines and blending them and making sure they're bottles bottle ready and shelf stable and so that that part I learned at Willamette and um, you know it was a pretty big winery uh, it grew to be a pretty big winery I guess there was probably 40 45,000 cases when I started in 2003 and when I left in 15 it was 150,000 plus you know so you know sort of saw I saw oversaw a lot of that growth in terms of and and almost in a state winery at that time uh, so which is a cool story I mean they Jim bought grapes and then just started acquiring vineyards and planting vineyards until they're almost, I mean, they still do things on purpose where they buy grapes. Uh, the AVA series, for example, in the North Willamette also, uh, that Southern Oregon brand called Gr Griffin Creek, they buy Cab and Merlot and Syrah and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but, you know, they became a state basically for most of their, their major, major, um, distributed products and their forest in my tutelage. It was cool to see Jim Reno really double down and try to like grow his own grapes and also grow his winery at the same time. It was, pretty, it was a pretty cool experience. I ran a bottling line, which at first Forrest like got the thing going and then just left and just said keep adding stuff to the line, like corks and capsules and then when it stopped, he'd get really upset and come out and yell at me and <laughs> fix it and start it again. And then, and then I would, it would break down eventually. So that's how I learned to bottle wine. I, you know, I'm a college kid. I don't really know how to fix things. I'm not a mechanic, but I became pretty good at fixing that bottling line over the time as it broke down in various ways. We had, um, at that time, uh, Jim Bruneau was trying to bottle um, and use labor just from the people that were shareholders in the company. Uh, he was a very interesting guy. He started a winery with no money, with other people's money. But it wasn't corporations' money, it was just people's money, <laughs> you know. He did an initial public offering, self-underwritten initial public offering for a winery. That might be the first one ever in the country, I think. Um, but those people who owned shares came and bottled the wine with me <laughs> in those days. Um, and they were like, you know, they would get free wine when they walked off the bottling line uh, before their troubles. And I think they were paid in wine credits as well. 
but it was just a whole different story. And then when they wouldn't show up or we had problems, I would just have to go out and get vineyard people right out of the vineyard, like, get in my car, let's go to the winery and bottle wine. It was the craziest experience, trial by fire. But I figured out how to run a bottling line eventually. Um, and then I became a cellar master. Noel eventually left to start his own. Uh, well, he worked for Signature Bottling Lines, and then he started his own bottling line. So he actually has his own bottling line these days um, that he, he owns himself. But which is so cool. Um, but um, I stayed on, was promoted to cellar master, then assistant winemaker, then associate winemaker. My my boss got uh, tongue cancer of the tongue, forced, and lost his taste buds uh, for the legendary 2008 harvest. So I had to blend all these wines without his taste buds. But he came into the winery just during cancer treatment and still helped me to make decisions. He's like just. Think about how I would do it, which was really a very weird thing to say. But in blending wine is, it's weird. It's like a, a shared hallucination almost. Like it's a, um, you know, we're all just sort of uh, they are saying what we think, but eventually we understand what each other means when they say certain things. And so it was a really cool uh, experience with him to blend wine without it when he doesn't have a tongue. He only has a nose. And he, had a, and he had a pretty good nose, actually, when he lost his taste buds. Um, so that was really, really interesting. And then, and then he went into remission. Um, I think before I said he died in 2009, I think it was, it was 11, actually, because he came back for nine and 10 and um, was in remission, which was fantastic. I went back to, you know, I ran the place without him. I went back to kind of his assistant and he ran it for a while, but we did a really great job of being very copacetic there for a while. Um, and yeah, it was 11, I guess, that he passed. I said nine, but I'm in 11. It was, um, he, so towards the end, you know, like the cancer uh, was in remission, but it was actually active in a couple different places in his body. Nobody knew his cat, can't, cat sand showed up a lot, a lot of cancer in a lot of different places. And so it was kind of the end game there. Five different cancers, they were, weren't able to fight them. So um, he had a pretty wealthy brother-in-law um, who said, I tell you what, let's go see the Rolling Stones in London or let's go see the Taj Mahal. What do you want to, you know, what do you want to go do and see? And if you can believe it, that guy wanted to bring in the harvest with me. Which is... I'm gonna cry a little bit, a little, I guess, a little bit, but um, but that's pretty cool yeah. that he did that. Yeah. And uh, so, anyway, Forest Last Harvest was 11, was 2011. We made some good wines, and uh, when he passed, I was holding the bag. So I was the head winemaker at Willamette Valley Vineyards for, um, I guess, for the, from then on. Even though you know I had I had, I had played that role before, um, but uh, and I had his son as my assistant winemaker, Daniel uh, Shepherd. Um, and so that was a, in, in a lot of his uh, high school friends and forest hires there at Willamette there after he'd passed. So it was, it was cool. We were making wine as the same team just without our fearless leader. And um, so that was, a lot, that was a lot of fun, um, uh, you know, uh, having, spending time with all those guys and seeing them become, di you know, different people. You know, Daniel now, um, has had a lot of different uh, roles in the, in, the, in the wine industry, and uh, Brandon is still there. His um, his, his high school friend um, as the production manager there. So, and those guys are, you know, if you ask me what my favorite accomplishments are in the wine industry, it would not be like a score that I got from some magazine or something. It'd be basically those guys, because when I met them, they were just, you know, 16-year-old kids and. You know, now they're production managers and assistant winemakers and things, and so it was great to see that happen and bring that along, even uh, despite the tragedy of losing, you know, my mentor and their mentor really as well, Forrest. So, anyway, um, that was a that was quite a lot of years there at Willamette that I kind of ran ran together, um, but there was yeah, there's a lot of um, excellent vineyards that I got a chance to work with. They, they you know. Um, Elton Vineyard, I would say, is one of my favorites, and, and it was one that we'd worked with um, for, for a long time at Willamette Valley Vineyards, even before me. Um, 
As it turns out, Dick and Betty O'Brien were friends with Jim Bruneau from the way back. Dick and uh, Jim were uh, at uh, Willamette University and the Graduate School for Business around the same time. And that would have been the 80s, I think. And um, anyway, they were fantastic growers. And um, at some point, Dick wanted to retire. He was a high school teacher. And um, just kind of, and he was a vineyard manager, and he just wanted us to tend his epic garden. Uh, and that's what he did. And so he turned over the management of his vineyard to us, which it was my project. I was forced was still alive, but it was cool to work uh, with Elton Vineyards and to um, sell fruit to all kinds of people from A. F. E. Ken Wright, Michael Stevenson at Panther Creek got some of that, the Chardonnay, of course. Um, I don't know, it's really fun. I, I met a lot of different winemakers that way, and a lot of winemakers told me how they wanted me to grow their grapes. So I learned a lot about uh, viticulture that way and spent a lot of time working at, um, uh, or going to school, taking different classes at, at Chemeketa um, from Al McDonald and uh, quite a few other wonderful teachers there. And um, I guess I was all right at making wine and understood chemistry and food chemistry, but I didn't know very much about wine grape growing. So um, working with Dick and Betty O'Brien, especially Dick, and uh, the, the classes at Chemeketa, I became better at viticulture and, uh, and added that to the, the sort of the, 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 the tool set. Especially as Willamette became more of a, um, a state property too, we were able to plant more vineyards and grow more grapes. And so we understood over time what worked and what didn't work. And we were able to reapply that as we planted the, these grapevines. So that was a really a huge growing experience Willamette Valley Vineyards for me in, in understanding viticulture um, through, the, the, through Elton and then also through Chemeketa. And then eventually um, Betty's brother sold a huge parcel of land above Elton, and um, then there was a long-term lease on another par parcel, so that, that contiguous vineyard is 250 planted acres. It was cool to be able to plan those out and help, help design that vineyard and plant that vineyard, which is above the Hopewell Church in the Old Amity wine growing region of the, old, uh, of, of the North Wind Valley, and it's well, just a legendary vineyard, so cool. Um, leaving Willamette, I miss so many people and so many things, but I miss that vineyard desperately. It's just a really wonderful vineyard. I still buy wine from that vineyard and drink it uh, all the time. It's just fan it's a fantastic vineyard. Uh, so um, that I really, really miss th that that particular vineyard in the Old Amity Hills. So wonderful. I should also say something about the Twalton Estate property. Um, um, to go back a lot further, there were three. Hopefully I can get this right. I might be saying things wrong, but uh, I'm going to try it here. Um, there were three um, candidates for graduation in the, uh, at UC Davis in 1964. And they were um, Chuck Corey, right? David Lett, and um, the gentleman who eventually started Tualatin Estate Vineyards. Um, and um, it, it was just an interesting thing. So Chuck Corey and David Lett came to Oregon at that time, uh, stayed in Silverton, looked for different places to plant vineyards, um, and then returned to California, got together a Massal selection, both of them at different times of different vines, uh, Pinot Noir vines, and then brought them to, brought them to the North Willamette Valley. Um, Bill Fuller was what was the other, was the third person there that was that was graduating from UC Davis. The two um, uh, Lett and Curie uh, never actually graduated. They um, well now Curie had an interesting thesis, and it was how wouldn't it be a cool idea to grow Pinot Noir in Oregon? <laughs> and that thesis was never accepted, and never graduated from UC Davis. Um, Lett never put one forward, as far as I can tell, talking to Jason, but um, 
But Bill Fuller did, and it was all about PVPP or ion exchange columns. It was very boring chemistry uh, stuff that we all now take for granted and is used in large wineries. I believe it was ion exchange, resin columns, something like that. And he, he, he was accepted, he was, he was graduated, and, and he got a chance to work with Louis Martini, um, who was the biggest grower of Pinot Noir by acreage at that time in California. And so while he certainly dealt with a lot of grapes and, uh, you know, um, and back then, you know, there were, there were a lot of other varietals we don't even think about now, but he got a chance to work with Pinot Noir at that time. And so when he came back to um, Oregon in 74, um, he was looking for a, a, a place to grow Pinot Noir and he had an investor um, named Bill as well. Bill, I believe, was that a guy named Bill Muskinung? I might get that wrong. But um, uh, but anyway, so so they passed on what the place is called Navarro in, in the Anderson Valley, and they decided to purchase a Tual in Tualatin Valley. I mean, Tual the Tualatin Valley around they call it Tualatin Estate Vineyards, but it's um, really right outside the town of Forest Grove, um, the Tualatin River Valley. That's what's called Tualatin, and uh, it was a site that. Uh, the locals notice like ripened strawberries a bit earlier than other places. It has a nice rain shadow up against the higher Trask Mountain Range that's in the northern, northern, northern part of the wine valley where we grow wine grapes there. And um, anyways, it's, it was a bit warmer and a bit, bit drier than other places. And um, Jim Bruneau purchased that uh, when Bill was ready to retire. Uh, and then also purchased a, a large portion above it was help uh, with the help of a guy named Peter Michael, not the most famous Peter Michael you might think about from California, but another man named Peter Michael. And anyway, those two vineyards together were about 215 acres of windblown loses, uh, very much lower wood soil like we're sitting in right now, and um, over Willa Kinsey soil, the ancient uh, elevated seafloor. Um, with Wimble Moses on top of it, very beautiful vineyard. It was lovely working with that vineyard. I'll, I'll say an aside, uh, in a tangent, as you encouraged me to do. Um, somewhere in there, I guess it must have been 2012, um, Forrest got a chance to meet with Bill. Uh, we, we honored him with some kind of an award or Maybe it was Giannis Miglos had a book uh, signing in our winery, but Bill Fuller was there. And we dragged him downstairs and started tasting him on his old blocks, you know, that he had planted. And he had, he had retired a long time ago, but he came out of uh, retirement at 80 years old to help me make uh, some wines after Forrest had passed. And that was really fun to make wine with a pioneer. You know, um, those guys all knew each other. Um, Bill came later, you know, after Curry and Lett, but he had worked as the enologist and also assistant winemaker for the man that knew the most about growing and making Pinot Noir in North America at that time. Um, you know, and so when he came to Oregon, I think Lett and Curry knew a lot about how to grow wine grapes in the North Willamette Valley because um, they had been at it, right, for 10 years or more at that point. But um, Bill knew how to make Pinot Noir into wine, mm -hmm. <laughs> perhaps better than those guys did in, in a way. And, I'm, and especially the newcomers, too, at that point, uh, were, were, were really interested in talking to him. I think his phone rang off the hook for a while. He did a lot of cool things. You, you guys have got that in the archives, brought two different disparate groups together to form one cohesive structure that has then broke apart later on, um, as you know. But anyway, he reminds me, he reminds me of the Jim Bruneau of his time in that he really was on a plane a lot of times um, promoting those wines. And while he wasn't uh, part of those first tastings, um, uh, the famous tastings uh, of, of Oregon wines versus Burgundy at first, that David Lett was part of. He certainly visited France with some of those some of his wines and did very well in, in, in subsequent f competitions. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it was fun to work with that guy who had a definite stake in the beginning uh, and, and spent a lot of time growing the, the, the vintage and for him to come out of retirement to make wine with me was just really, really fun. And uh, he's still at it. I mean, he's still a, a force at Willamette Valley Vineyards. He went saw Francois Ferrer barrels. He, he, pour, he had me pour a, 
a liter of skim milk into Chardonnay barrels, whether it needed or not. You know, like, how's that for like casein finding milk, like actual milk? He was just, it was, there's so many cool things that he, that he did and we did together that were a whole lot of fun. Um, he hired a gentleman named Efren Loesa uh, out of, um, I mean, just I'm fresh off the boat from Mexico um, years and years ago in, in, in the around 76 or something like that. Um, and Efren uh, grew to become a cellar master and then when he sold the, the vineyard to Jim Bruneau, um, became the vineyard manager, still lives in the house that Bill lived in. And uh, now, now uh, Efren has, uh, through his connection with Willamette Valley Vineyards, Jim always says he's the oldest employee because he started way before Jim even was interested in wine at 12th and Estate. That, that gentleman, if you can believe, has planted 600 acres and now Manning is around 1,000 acres of, of vineyard in, in the North Willamette Valley, um, all, over, all over the North Willamette Valley, many different AVAs. And so what a humble beginning for someone who now is so important to our industry and, and, and especially to Willamette Valley Vineyards. Mm -hmm. So it's fun working with all those guys at Willamette Valley Vineyards. And what a fun, what a fun thing. I think it covered Forrest, uh, Bill, and um, and Efren. I can tell a story or two on Jim Bruneau, of course. Um, he's that's a very colorful guy. I think I'll have to just go to OPC. He was always very um, dramatic, flamboyant. I don't know how to say it with his with his OPC buses. And he was always part of the melee. Um, the last one that I know about, that he was part of, and he, he might have become banned from buses because of this this OPC event, but um, I don't know if you guys ever remember a guy named Mark Pape. He was a, uh, he started a, um, a restaurant that is now called Bistro Maison on 3rd Street in McMinnville. And um, he um, employed both uh, Carolyn uh, uh, Beju and um, Todd Hamina, that now own Hamina Beju. Um, and a, a guy named uh, Eric McLaughlin, who mm -hmm. worked as a, a salesperson for, well, and he's a Linfield graduate. graduate. Yes, absolutely. He was going to Linfield when he was basically, or just graduated from Linfield when he became the sommelier, a very young sommelier of that restaurant. Anyway, Mark worked in uh, wine sales for a lot of folks, uh, including Tony Soder and uh, Walnut City Wine Works over the years. But um, he, Mark, Mark and Jim Renault were... Um, in charge of the bus, an OPC bus, and it must have been 2012 or something. Jim Bruneau was on the phone with me while the bus was parked at Bethel Heights. He's like, you guys can come up here with your cars. Can you go and buy a bunch of red streamers and like just bomb the other buses? And so, and then, and then we, he, he sent me in his phone some like printed meme material that I printed up and put around the buses. It was, I mean, it was the craziest thing. We like attacked his bus, essentially toilet papered his bus with propaganda. Oh, it was just crazy. They, I believe they brought an un, unloaded shotgun on the bus. Um, they were drinking and dry. It was the craziest, craziest, craziest thing. I shouldn't go into too much of, uh, too much incriminating material, but um, that was, Mark is, not, is no longer with us. He passed away only a few years after that, but um, that was a great last hurrah for Mark, who was always a party animal. And, and Jim Bruneau is very encourageable, and like th none of those guys could stop each other. It was just like no holds barred. So we, in, in, in the wine industry sometimes, especially when you have restaurant tours and people who sell wine, um, it gets out of hand very quickly. You know, it really can, it really can get that way. Um, so anyway, that's, <laughs> maybe that's it for Jim Bruneau. Jim Bruneau is an entrepreneur. If, if you could figure out how to do f all the great ideas that that guy has, uh, you, 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 would, you would rule the world. I mean, it's just, he's a fantastic idea person. Um, he needs people who can take his ideas and run with them and keep them going and, and maintain the vision. Um, you know, of course, that was forced in my role for so many years. Mm -hmm. But um, but uh, but a great a great a great person for our industry. He's a lobbyist. He's a political entity, and um, and so he can always uh, always 
has the ears of our legislatures, which is a fantastic um, person in our industry. Um, so that's the Willamette Valley Vineyards years, I guess. I don't oh, know. I it was it. like 15 years. <laughs> I don't know. Well, tell me about then from there to here. How did you get here? Well, I just, I really liked Willamette and working with so many different lots and all that stuff, but I wanted to work in a, like a real honest to goodness large, uh, I wouldn't say factory of wine, but just a larger production facility. I, I just thought, you know, I'm a food scientist and I love, I love um, having all these different toys and not toys, but machinery and different abilities to manipulate wine, microoxygenation, oak alternatives, these things are, you know, in Oregon we mostly make wine the same old boring way, which is fantastic, it's a traditional way, and it makes wonderful, wonderful wines, but I don't know, I, uh, I just tired of perhaps all my old vineyards and things like that, I'd, I'd give anything to work with them again in some cases, but anyway, it was just, a, it, I made a break and I took a job as the red wine maker at, at A to Z, which was really, really fun. Um, you guys know A to Z purchased this wonderful, uh, iconic older vineyard called Rex Hill and then built large, large, expansive metal buildings all over the place that uh, makes it um, perhaps Oregon's largest brand. Certainly uh, Oregon's largest uh, brand made under one roof. You know, there's some other brands that are pretty big, but they're made in different, uh, uh, places and assembled at 12th and Maple and things like that. So it's the, you know, but this, this, and even A to Z, uh, maybe even to this day, maybe not entirely made at A to Z. There was always partners as they tried to like build up to expand to their, to their size now. But it was fun. It was like, it was working with uh, over 200,000 cases of wine from 33 vineyards um, from the border of, of, of Oregon and California, Medford area, all the way out to the Columbia River Gorge, the Mid Valley, the South Valley, the North Valley. I stepped into so, m put my feet into so many different vineyards in Oregon and large ones with huge acreage. I mean, I did the calculations. It was with Willamette and A to Z, these feet have gone to 70 or 75% of the acreage in the state of Oregon. Um, it was just so, and then I, you know, because I tagged along to some of the Rex Hill stuff, and um, even though I was just the red wine maker at A to Z, I also got a chance to taste a lot of white wine, Pinot Gris, and Chardonnay from all over the state. So that was fun, and also a lot of work in Southern Oregon, the Illinois Valley, um, the Rogue Valley, it was really fun to learn about those different wine growing regions, even though. I had worked with them at Willamette Valley Vineyards, uh, making Cab, Merlot, and, and Saran stuff. This was Pinot Noir. These are gigantic Pinot Noir vineyards um, planted by savvy growers down there that know they have a warmer climate. Um, and so we were harvesting Pinot Noir from Jacksonville in August and all the way till almost November in the North Willamette Valley. So that was really fun. And worked with really great viticulturalists, but I was like the fifth winemaker on the staff. You know, the ownership's winemakers, everybody, it, that was a very difficult uh, place to figure out what your role was and that sort of thing. But what a fantastic group of tasters. I mean, we really had excellent tasters with very highly developed senses of, of taste and smell for just the wines we made in the Lamb Valley. That was a really great experience in running the tasting groups and working on microoxygenation, oak alternatives, um, Reverse osmosis, lease filtration, uh, new lease filtrations uh, machinery. They've just bought one that's really, really cool. So, anyway, just a lot of technology uh, and a lot of fun there. But um, I don't know, it was a bit like making wine from an uh, uh, ivory tower. I always call that new building the ivory tower because it's a little wide up, up top and you're just three or four stories away from the people that are down there making the wine. And you can watch them do your bidding and it's a lot of spreadsheets and organization. I became a much more organized winemaker with my time there. But at the same time, I, saw, I really missed all the, all the traditional, you know, North Willamette traditional winemaking stuff. So I, um, I started looking for another job. You know, as, as fun as that was, and oh gosh, we work with Steve Price, which is, is a fantastic uh, uh, viticulturalist and enologist in his own vineyard as well. Um, I just, I, there were so many great connections from that place, from wine grape growing all the way to uh, academia, 
but um, but in the end, I just I missed this. I, we, the winery you're sitting in now was really where I, I felt like I, I guess I was meant to be. So instead of working at the third largest brand in Oregon and the first largest brand in Oregon, I took a job with the 600th largest brand in Oregon <laughs> or whatever. Everybody has 10,000 cases and 50 acre vineyard here at, at Willamette and uh, I mean at, um, at Hawksview uh, and um, yeah, I mean, it's just me. I make all the wines. I do. I wash every barrel. Um, I do get some help during harvest. I usually hire a person or two. Um, there's a vineyard manager who mostly drives tractor. We hire him a helper um, during this time of year when we have to drive two tractors. Um, uh, the ownership is, a, is an Italian gentleman from um, Southern California, Temecula. He owns another winery, two wineries in California as well as a hotel and restaurants and stuff and um, knows how to do direct to consumer which is fantastic. I think that's the wave of the future, you know, getting the full retail dollar and not selling in the distributed model. Most of those other places I worked at um, were more distributed model folks. Um, and so this is fun. There's a like, um, you know, I just know every barrel. I know every block. I look every grape in the eye. Uh, I sort all the grapes myself with, with some help. So it's it's a whole different story. We get a chance to buy a little bit of fruit from Southern Oregon. I'm still making some wines from the vineyards of Griffin Creek, like I did back at uh, Willamette, which is fun because some of the customers here like the bigger reds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we buy a little fruit. We also sell a little fruit. Um, I get a chance to sell wine grapes to Jacques Chardy, who's now uh, no longer at Montenor. He's at Torrymore. Um, so that's fun to, to just sell him wine grapes. He sold me some brandy too this last harvest that I added a wine and so I made a fortified wine here, a port, port style. You know, you don't want to use the word port, it says place name. But just like I uh, learned to do with my mentor Forrest at Willamette Valley Vineyard. So um, even though this is a small estate, Pinot specific, you know, Pinot Green Chardonnay specific vineyard, and, and, and winery, I still get a chance to play. Uh, uh, Claudio allows me to make some port and some some big reds and um, I've just been excited uh, recently to be able to purchase some wine grapes from uh, the Oregon side of Walla Walla um, from the Zerba folks. Um, Zerba, I, I, I haven't been a member of many wine clubs as a winemaker um, as I get a great discount and kind of play the field but I was actually a member of Zerba's wine club mostly for the Syrah, uh, and, uh, and now I'm being able to work with that fruit is just fantastic for me. I love, I love, I love it, it's one of my the highlights of what I've got in the cellar right now. So I just, uh, that's a fun part of this, uh, this job. 100% 100, 100 uh, creative control after A to Z, it's nice to not be one of five winemakers, but just be my, my own self. And it's, uh, I get to make all the, all the choices, and, um, and that's nice, good, good creative control, and. The only people that I have to please are the are the members. There's not we don't submit to scores. It's not a game where we're in a distributed model where we have to have scores to get on a shelf to to sell bottles. We don't. We don't even do play that game, which is great. Um, uh, I don't miss that very much. Um, it's just yeah, it's a fantastic place. And then there's also a lot of investment. You're sitting in a what, this reminds me of a rooftop bar in, in like in, in Portland, you know, or something. I guess that's what it is. It's open to three sides with a stunning views of the valley. And then, you know, they've spent a lot of money here, uh, you know, sort of uh, working on that direct to consumer, bringing customers out here, selling them an experience while we're selling them some wine. And, uh, and so that's really great. I'm glad to be part of that part of our industry right now as it grows and fulfills or you know, works into um, having true you know, high-end lodging and dining. Arguably, we've always had high-end dining, but more of it all the time. And then also uh, a great customer experience. You know, when I started in the wine industry, many of my favorite wineries, you couldn't even go there and taste the wine unless you had an appointment and they wanted you to they wanted some case buyers from the east coast you know and uh that's totally not the case anymore where you can go there uh those same iconic wineries and uh, pay twenty dollars and get the full experience and um 
Yeah, I think that's great now that we're able to do that. I mean, the COVID has set us back in that regard. We're back to taking invitations or, 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 or um, reservations rather, but uh, I think uh, we'll get back to being able just to taste people, anybody on, on our wines, so. Tell me about, uh, I know you're involved in a number of educational parts of the Oregon wine industry. Uh, sure. talk, you talk about your experience at Chemeketa as a student. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your experience as uh, on the Chemeketa board and, and other other places you're working in and, and why. Sure. So Betty O'Brien asked me to be on the Chemeketa board, uh, I think, around the time that Forrest passed, 2011. It's a really fantastic organization with a lot of really smart folks. Uh, and leaders in the Willamette Valley, and so I was on the I was on the board for for several years now, and um, it's just a way to kind of give back. You know, I I I, um, I learned a lot. I, I I have two degrees in science from Purdue University, but I still didn't know how to grow wine grapes, and I, that re I needed to know how to grow wine grapes in my career, and Schmeckel was able to provide that. Uh, information and it was just the information that I needed after work the time that I needed it, uh, it it just it made so much sense to me and I've hired graduates from that from that uh, community college over the years and um, you know they've struggled with you know staffing you know you get good people involved and then they move on to sometimes be winemakers sometimes they go grow, grow grapes somewhere else um, but there was an opportunity to teach a wine appreciation course, and you know that goes back to Dr. Vine. I mean, that's where I caught the bug of winemaking, and um, or really realized it was possible. Um, and so to teach that class again, or to teach, teach that class even that I had taken in a different way with Shemekita, was just so fantastic in a way to, you know, it's not like. Um, it's 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 a lot of time, and it's not like a huge amount of money or anything like that. It's, um, but but it's uh, it, just to me, it's just like a, a fantastic way to beat the future of the wine industry face to face, and then to talk about how we taste wines. I wish I would have had, uh, I would have taken, um, especially the sensory analysis. Uh, class that I teach right now because it teaches you about your own palate mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a method of self-discovery. So it's not very pleasant, but we taste all kinds of different acids at different levels, sugar at different levels, and water and wine. And eventually we understand, begin to understand how our uh, palates are um, wired, how strong we are at smelling TCA, how good we are at volatile acidity and that sort of thing. And so um, and turning young, and actually, funnily enough, it, it's all ages. It, it, I mean, we have people that are 18, because 18 year olds can taste wine now in academic setting, all the way to people that are over 70 years old. Mm -hmm. And, um, but there's sometimes those people, even though they might be older, are new to tasting wine. Anyway, I love turning on new tasters to what their palate can do for them. And I really wish I had done that before I had gone into industry, I, you know, I, I, I figured it out in industry slowly but surely over a lot of time. In, in fact, a lot of time uh, spent at uh, A to Z with a bunch of smart, intelligent winemakers with really good palates together in a room. You begin to figure out your palate very quickly that way. Um, but, you know, also many years at Willamette tasting with Forrest and just working on it. I wish I had done that before I, I, I had ever set a foot in a winery because I, I believe that would have served me very well. I'm, gl I'm glad to have, well, give the gift of that self-discovery to new, to new people all the time. Because they do the work. They, they're the ones that discover their own palates. But um, to present to them the ability to do that or the opportunity to do that is really, it's been, a, it's been one of the best things I've done in the whole industry, uh, quite frankly. Um, and also, I would also say live too. I mean, Jim Bruno was very instrumental in live. A couple of times, it was his infusions of of personal cash that kept the thing going. Years ago, I was in those meetings, you know, with Alan. Um, gosh, what is Alan's last name? Holstein's um, guidance. Uh, you know, he was always the you know, the, the treasurer of the live organization. And he was always like, we're going to go bankrupt. That was his whole thing. He was always, okay, let's, let's listen to Alan how we're gonna go bankrupt. 
And um, and a few times Jim saved the day with his own pocketbook and and that of his shareholders, uh, the Willamette Valley Vineyards folks, uh, have ke kept that going, that, that organization going in the darker days. And um, I, I believe it was he, he or Betty O'Brien, one of the two that suggested uh, me for the board. I spent 10 years on the board. I uh, was the chairperson of, of Live as well uh, during that time. Um, seen a lot of interesting things happen. Mimi Castile leaving because of her just hatred for glyphosate. Um, that affecting the board. We now only allow one application of glyphosate. We may, I say we, they may go to zero pretty soon. Um, all kinds of different fights over different chemicals over the years. Um, I helped I guess my por portion of it, um, they brought me on board, uh, I, I guess it would be Pat Dudley and um, Ed Fuss and a couple of their folks brought me on board as a someone that n knew pr the production side of things and uh, um, what well, must be 14 years ago now to help elucidate a set of rules um, that would help us provide a path for wineries to move down a sustainability uh, uh, path itself. And so anyway, um, we it's not IOBC, uh, International Organization for Biological Control, sanctioned, but we developed our own set of rules, mostly stealing from a very good project in South America, uh, South Africa. Um, as, as, along with a few things that are happening in California, there's some organic uh, certification stuff we stole and sort of put it into, all into this cool um, sustainability certification for wineries, um, even though we had just worked with vineyards up until that point. And that was my big work on the, on the, uh, on the board. We now have a very robust and I believe the first of its kind certification, uh, winery cer sustainability certification in, in the world. The um, South African project we stole from, and also the winery-wise stuff from Washington, were just best practices, and they didn't—they weren't as um, a certification. So, anyway, we wanted something very much like the the live winery uh, vineyard certification with the red, yellow, and green list and things like that. So, we sort of took all those things together, put them together, and birthed the uh, you know winery sustainability certification organization. So that was fun. Uh, and and uh, it still is on today. I don't I don't uh, participate quite as much. Although we are live certified here in the winery and vineyard, but um, but yeah, that's something I'm proud of, and I really in, in enjoyed working with all those intelligent winemakers over the day, over the years. The, we don't get a chance to all meet together. There's no, you know, the brewers have this cool thing called Oregon Brewers Guild, where they all meet and talk about issues every month. Whereas you know the wine, Oregon wine industry, we don't. We have different different ways of meeting and talking but that one was one of them where we got a chance to meet together and at least talk about sustainability recycling um how we are sustainable in a in a winery instead of just in a vineyard so, so one more question for you uh let's talk about the future a little bit so, uh, tell me about what the future here is for you and then talk to you and how you kind of see the future for oregon wine the future for Hawksview is just to, I think, continue to grow. I mean, we've just got this new tasting room, which will sell more wine. And I think we have a 50-acre vineyard with, with fantastic wine grapes. Um, we sell grapes to Union and some other folks. I suppose we'll just slowly but surely take those contracts over and make the wine that we grow here ourselves. Um, uh, it's, it's, a fan, it's a fantastic direct to consumer business and I'm, uh, I'm I, I like this sort of interesting Italian guy from out of state bringing his Italian viticulturalist and direct to consumer know, know how from Southern California which is a very much more busy uh, consumer facing sort of uh, industry so I'm, I'm excited to see those kind of ideas play themselves out in the Willamette Valley we're very close to Portland um, in Temecula they have 20 million people that live two hours drive away. We have about a million and a half, you know, or something like that. It's not the same thing, but but um, but it's kind of like that. If we're very consumer facing, very Portland, mm -hmm. close to Portland, easy to get to, uh, direct to consumer. Every drop of wine is sold to a consumer. So um, it's it's a. I just want to see what 
that business can do. I, I got a chance to see William Valley Vineyards diversify and really spend a lot of money and time on that aspect of what they did um, and, and continue to do direct to consumer. They still, of course, sell a lot of wine in the distributor model. But I just, I love this slice of it. I love this very high end, um, consumer experience driven kind of winery. So I, I, I think that's the future of Oregon wine, or a part of that is the future of Oregon wine. Folks that were 10 to 30,000 cases that, that loved the distributed model and made their, made their wine and money go through that model um, are gonna struggle as distributors consolidate, um, as the Southerns and the Generals and the, you know, the, the, these, these large multi-state uh, conglomerations of capital uh, control the wine industry and the distributed distributor model. Folks like Willamette Valley Vineyards, of course, will always have a place in that. But the smaller ten to thirty thousand folks, ten to thirty thousand case folks, are really they, they have to do this direct to consumer, or they won't. I don't. I b believe they'll have a tough time. They won't exist eventually. If if I'm afraid that they won't exist, and that's I, what I love about our industry is so many different small producers. Pinot Noir lends itself to that. You know, they're, the, all of these wines are different. I. My owner kind of has a different idea. He's he's he works in a different wine industry, you know, and doesn't know Oregon so much. He's learning a lot, but he he said something like, "Well, you know, you can't just have any old winemaker into your cellar and show him what you do, because you know, aren't there secrets, you know, and to winemaking that we can't share with each other that makes our wine so different from each other?" And I and I said, "Well, you know, I'm never really afraid of that in Oregon. I, no one can make my wines because they." don't have the vineyard, right? And that's that's really what makes the wines. And um, so, I don't know, he has a different way of looking at the world and, and the industry, and I think he's coming around. He'll be, I think he'll be a, a, a collaborator, a co-conspirator co uh, in no time. And he already has become, through IPNC, um, where he's learned a lot and has been able to share a lot about wine grapes. And so, so anyway, yeah, I, I think that's the future too of Oregon. The industry is further collaboration. You know, when you tr when you go to IPNC and you start talking to French folks, they would say that um, our, our, the greatest value that we have in our industry is not our fantastic vineyards and 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 these wonderful places we, we you know we, we sell where we sell wine and and, and treat the the customers to wonderful experience. He, they would say it's the AVAs. They would say it's because we've decided to start talking about what one wine grape tastes like when it's grown in a variety of different microclimates and soil situations, and that is the future of the Oregon wine industry. Well, we've just had the new AVAs come out, mm -hmm. um, so that's really a timely thing to talk about. I mean, it is um, that's our big value. That's what we have to sell to our customers. Uh, and it still plays into that idea of the experience, right? Um, I know, and when I started working in the wine industry in 2001, I looked on Ken Wright's website, and he knew, even back then, that when you grow Pinot Noir in non-alluvial sedimentary soils or uh, ancient volcanic uh, soils that have been rained on for 50 million years, you make very different wines um, from the same grape, from the same clone. Um, I think if you told me that before I became a winemaker in Oregon, I would I would say that you're full of shit. You know what I mean? But I guess I had I had had I had been to Burgundy by then, and I had and I had tasted those wines um, from Burgundy, and I guess I would have said, yes, that happens in Burgundy, but I don't know about the New World, right? Well, I'm here to tell you, after 20 years in the Willamette Valley and the wine industry, that there not only do the different vineyards give you different expressions of those different clones, but rather they all have a, I don't know, more like a um, familiar resemblance to each other within some of these AVAs. And especially the ones where they're talking about soil type, like the new Laurelwood district that you're, si you're sitting in right now. This is all, every last bit of this vineyard is Laurelwood. Down there, right there is the tip of the Missoula flood soil. Everything else is Laurelwood. Jory with, Laurel, with windblown moses on top. This is going to give you wine grapes with a floral, pretty, 
sort of intensity, hibiscus and rose petal. I, I learned that when I worked with the, with the Aloro fruit at Willamette Valley Vineyards years and years ago, and then at A to Z too, we got that fruit. And as the vines get older, they become more jewelry. The oldest vines over here from 94, I mean 84, begin to show a little bit of that beautiful jewelry volcanic soil. So the thing is, the future of the Oregon wine industry is the more exploration of those types of ideas, more subdivision of our North Willamette Valley and also existing AVAs and the smaller AVAs based on soil type um, and microclimate. Um, we're at the beginning of a huge odyssey that took Burgundy 2,000 years to realize, right? We have a head start on them. We, we have some science. We're the second, you know, the second shot at it too. I mean, we're not, we're not starting over with Roman vines, you know, and, and so we have, we have a lot of, we're standing on the shoulders of a lot of really brilliant people. Um, but at the same time, the best vineyards might not be planted, you know. You, you know, I don't know, you probably don't do this, I, I do. I drive around the vineyard, the Willamette Valley, North Willamette Valley, and I'm like, that, what about that? <laughs> there were no trees right there, what about that? That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And or, um, why are they growing hazelnuts there, you know? And because that would be, you know, just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's more subdivision, expert intelligence subdivision of our, of our existing um, AVAs, and then also more exploration. Um, what, you know, there, we, we were getting a few more clones. What do new clones do in, in existing AVAs? What do, what do um, old clones do in, in new AVAs that we can pick out? How are these wines different? You know, in, 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 the, in the exploration of the Mid and Southern Valley, there is some really interesting things in the West Southern Valley um, uh, that are, they're very warm vineyard sites that are precocious, that are, 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 um, are harvested before we do things up here in the North Willamette Valley by two, three weeks, um, different soil types there as well. So there's a, there's a lot more to find and explore, and it takes forever, you know, wine takes forever. But um, I think, yeah, the future is just, um, it's more of that. And then more, more of, once we discover it more, how do we explain it mm -hmm. to our customers? Mm -hmm. And um, that's AVAs, that's education. Um, I think we'll also move in a sustainable direction. I mean, our cu customers want that. Uh, the growers want that. I mean, everybody wants that. The whole industry does. They're, and so that's kind of fantastic. I've, it's great to be in an industry that, first of all, is, has enough money in its value-added aspect to be able to talk about this, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think if you're growing soybeans right now, you get a chance to talk about sustainability like we do in this industry mm -hmm. um, because of the money that it represents. Our value-added proposition is, is something also that is val very valuable to us. Uh, and that gives us an ability to talk about um, how, to, how to farm our land in a way that makes the most sense and does the least harm and also makes the best wine. So yeah, more of that sort of thing. Thank you so much Thanks for sharing your time it. and your stories today, your perspectives, and we'll go ahead and let you off the hook, Don. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.